For today's cook, I'm going to show you how I took my cast iron skillet to a complete new level. You're going to be seeing some incredible meats that you would normally not cook on one of them. And some turn out just awesome, others not so much. And the main goal for this video is to see if the cast iron skillet can cook every single meat. So let's do it. And we're going to start off with the Flintstone steak. As the name says it, it is the biggest steak you can actually find. And this is the reason why. As you can see, it is a monster steak. It is also not very popular and very difficult to find. But when you have a great meat dealer, he can always hook you up. And as you can see, this one even has some bone marrow, which is definitely a plus. It is also about 1 inches thick. In regards to size, we're talking about 10 inches by 15 inches. And I know you're going to ask me for the weight. It is a 7.5 pound steak. Now take a look at my skillet. There's absolutely no way that this thing is going to fit in here. But we're definitely going to make it happen. From previous experiments with this steak, I know that if you don't cut out the fat on the edges, it will curl up on you. So if you happen to get one of these, make sure you remove the fat all the way around. And just in case you are wondering, the steak is still the same exact size. I just took out the fat around. For the seasoning, I kept it quite simple. A little bit of salt, freshly ground black pepper and garlic powder. Since this is a huge steak, make sure you season both sides. As you can see, by the time I was done, it's perfectly seasoned. To cook it, in order to ensure I have enough heat, I'm using my powerful gas stove. So I started by adding a little bit of grapeseed oil into the cast iron skillet. Once it was up to temperature, I added in my steak. And that was extremely challenging. You gotta move it around from edge to edge, make sure you fit that steak as best as you can and it is very challenging. You just gotta wiggle it, push it, tuck it and some way somehow I was able to fit it in. But that is what I would like to call a very tight squeeze. After cooking it for about two minutes it was now time to flip. And once I did, oof, it is another tight squeeze. But as you can see the cast iron skillet is working like a charm. My goal is to reach an internal temperature of 135 degrees Fahrenheit with this steak. And for that I recommend flipping it as much as possible. But that is easier said than done. But after flipping it around several times I was finally able to reach the internal temperature. And this is what I was left with. Here we have the Flintstone steak cooked on a cast iron. In Brazil we call this steak Capitão. And that's because it's the captain of all steaks. You will not find any bigger steak than this. I can't wait any longer and it's time to cut it open. And once I did, oof, perfectly medium rare just the way I like it. It will be a crime to cook it well done. And as you can see, the cast iron skillet did its job perfectly. And as I went in for the bite, I'll tell you one thing, it is not the most tender steak I've ever had. It does have a wonderful flavor and if you ever want to cook a monster steak like this, make sure you cut it real thin. Because I'll tell you one thing, this is not a tasting steak. It is one that you can feed the whole family and it should definitely be on your bucket list at least once. Moving on to the very next cook, we're talking about pork chops. Delicious, beautiful pork chops that it's perfectly cooked with your cast iron skillet. This one is gonna be good. And of course, we start off with the beautiful pork chops. As you can see, these are bone in. And most importantly, they have wonderful marbling throughout the meat. As you already know, this is a sign that it's gonna be nice and tasty. The first thing I like to do is to transfer it to a steak plate so that my seasoning will not fly all over the place. Talking about seasoning, I started with salt followed by freshly ground black pepper, garlic powder and obviously Guga's rub. You can use any type of seasoning you like, just make sure you season both sides. To cook it, you want to keep it under medium heat. As you can see, they are about an inch and a half thick. And if you keep the temperature too high, they'll just burn on you. Flip them as many times as necessary. The old saying of only flip once is not really true. And by flipping them multiple times, it will ensure that they cook evenly. And of course, do not forget to sear the fat and the edges. Because if there's one thing that you gotta cook to perfection, it's actually the fat. If you have great long tongues like I do right here, make sure you use them. As you can see, they are perfect to hold your pork chops exactly the way it needs to be. As they are cooking, you are looking for an internal temperature of 145 degrees Fahrenheit. That will give you perfect doneness for the pork chops. Once that internal temperature was reached, you can see that they are cooked to perfection. Now you want to let them rest for at least 3 minutes, which is the perfect timing for us to make a sauce. So using the same cast iron skillet, I threw in a bunch of white mushrooms. You want to cook them until you get a nice golden brown color just like this. To help reduce the moisture and also season them, I threw in a little bit of salt. Mix them well and make sure you remove that moisture. To deglaze the pan and add more flavor, I'm using half a cup of Marsala wine. Make sure to mix it well and remove all that goodness from the bottom. Then throw in one cup of chicken stock and mix it well. To finish it up, I added about a teaspoon of garlic paste, followed by a teaspoon of freshly ground black pepper and half a cup of heavy cream. Now all there's left to do is to melt two tablespoons of butter, mix it well and your sauce is done. That friends is exactly what you're looking for. For a nice beautiful finishing presentation, 
presentation, add in your pork chops, followed by a little bit of freeze-dried parsley, and you are left with a beautiful pork chop that anyone will love. That is perfect for any occasion, whether you're going on a date night or just serving yourself. This one will never disappoint. And as you can see, it was cooked to perfection. And just in case you are wondering, yes, a little bit of pink on your pork is absolutely okay. And I'll tell you one thing, this was absolutely delicious. And using that mushroom cream sauce to go along with it just takes everything to a whole new level. Now let's move into the master of all holiday roasts, because I'm talking about prime rib. And as you can see, this one is going to be phenomenal. And of course, we start off with a beautiful standing rib roast. As you can see, this one has two bones, and it will feed anywhere between three to four people. To make sure that my seasoning will stick, I like to also trim the edges. As you might know, salt cannot penetrate fat. So to make sure that we got seasoning throughout the whole meat, the external fat has to go. The very next thing I like to do is to French the bone. This is completely unnecessary and it's for presentation purposes only. The easiest way to do it is to use a meat hook. You can also use a very old knife. Definitely don't use your fancy knives for this. Because as you can see, by the time I was done, I was left with beautiful bones. And as I mentioned, it is for presentation purposes only. To ensure that it maintains its shape throughout the cooking process, I like to tressen it with butcher's twine. Now to me, this is one of the most important step. This is a thick piece of meat. And if you just season it with salt right now and put it directly into the oven to cook, I can almost guarantee you that that prime rib will not be perfect. And that's because the salt will not have enough time to penetrate nicely and deeply into the meat. So for that, I like to use what's called dry brine. It is just a fancy word which means season it with salt and leave it overnight on your refrigerator. The bigger the meat, the longer you should leave it. Just keep in mind to never exceed 48 hours. But after 24 hours, I took it out of the refrigerator and checked that out. The salt is completely gone. But as you can see, the fat did not absorb this. It. And that is one of the reasons I like to trim it all out first. The next thing we gotta do is quite important, which will develop the additional flavor. And that is to make a seasoned butter. I started with one teaspoon of black pepper, followed by another one of chili flakes, two teaspoon of garlic powder, two teaspoon of Guga's rub, two teaspoon of onion powder, six tablespoons of room temperature butter, and mix it well. Make sure you combine all of those ingredients together, because once you're done, you should be left with a beautiful seasoned butter just like this. But now going back to our prime rib, it's time to cook it. So I set my cast iron to medium high heat and make sure to get a nice sear in all sides including the edges. Once I completed the searing throughout the whole thing, you can see I was left with a beautiful prime rib. Pretty much every single piece is perfectly crusted and that is exactly what you're looking for. While it's still hot, I like to put it in a cooling rack so that I can start applying my butter and make sure you get every single edge because that is what will give your prime rib additional flavor. And do not be shy, my friends. I know you heard the saying butter makes everything better. And believe me when I tell you for a prime rib, that is absolutely true. To ensure that I'm cooking it to the perfect doneness, I am going to be using my wireless thermometer. Talking about that, I'm aiming for an internal temperature of 135 degrees Fahrenheit. Now all there's left to do is to set my oven to 250 degrees Fahrenheit and throw my prime rib in there. Let it cook until your desired internal temperature is reached. And once my was, I took it out of the oven, set it in my cutting board, and that is a perfectly cooked prime rib. I mean, there's not much to say, it is the perfect roast for the holidays or any occasion as a matter of fact. That my friends is as good as it gets. To carve it, the first thing you want to do is remove the butcher's twine. Then I recommend slicing the bones out. This will make the job nice and easy. Get yourself a nice big slicer and go to town. And as I took my first slice, even though it was rested, you can see it, this thing is extremely juicy. I would say it's the Niagara Fall of beef. And it's basically meat heaven. I'll tell you one thing, as I go in for my first bite, take a look at this. Absolutely perfection. It is one of those things that you cook and it brings memories. And for thick cuts like this, definitely use the dry brine technique. And whenever you're ready to cook your next holiday roast, using your cast iron skillet will definitely do the job. Because this one was truly delicious. Now the next one is truly special. And I think the cast iron was made 100% to make this. And we're talking about lemon chops. And the first thing I like to do is to make a marinade, which is super easy to do. So into the pesto and mortar, I threw in a little bit of black pepper, crushed it well until it was completely pulverized. Then I threw in some garlic, followed by parsley, thyme, and salt. Crushed it well and make sure everything combined into a paste, just like this. For the wet ingredients, I started with my favorite hot sauce, followed by Worcestershire sauce, and a good amount of olive oil. Mix it well and your marinade is done. That, friends, is as good as it gets. It is 
also quite strong. So just this much is plenty for a whole rack of lamb. Talking about that, this is the star of this cook. As you can see, mine came already Frenched. Usually they come just like this, ready for you to go. Here in the US, there are two kinds you can buy, either imported or domestic. And these are domestic. For the cast iron skillet, the best preparation is to take them apart. Just flip them on the fat cap and start chopping them between the bones. It is not a big deal. As you can see, by the time I was done, I was left with beautiful lamb chops. Now all there's left to do is to apply our marinade. The most important thing is to make sure every single one of them is coated. You can either do this by applying them individually one by one or throw them in the vacuum bag to make sure every single one is coated. Now the cool thing about it is that if you have a vacuum sealer or a vacuum chamber you will make this process real quick. Once it's completely vacuum sealed you want to leave it marinating on your refrigerator for at least two hours. But if you don't use a vacuum sealer you can leave them overnight. Once the marination time was done all there's left to do is to remove them and get them ready for the cast iron. And as you can see every single piece has a little bit of that marinade. Set your cast iron to medium high heat and add the lamb chops. Let it sear for about one minute and then it's time to flip. Keep in mind that they cook real quick and the last thing you want to do is to overcook lamb chops. You're shooting for an internal temperature of 135 degrees Fahrenheit and once that temperature was reached this is what I was left with. Perfectly cooked lamb chops and that cast iron sear is exactly what you're looking for. I think this might be the best way to cook lamb. It not only puts a beautiful crust on them but cooks them to perfection. That is how you want your lamb to be. Pink in the middle is always the way to go because you don't need any fork for this. It is best to use your hands. And we all know what Gordon Renz is thinking. Where's the lamb sauce? Using the same exact pan, I threw in two cups of chicken stock. You want to cook it and let it reduce to half. Once that's done, throw in half a cup of heavy cream. Mix it well and make sure you combine all of the ingredients together. Get two tablespoons of cold butter and incorporate that into the sauce. Once that's done, you are left with a perfect lamb sauce that is easy to make. But most importantly, make Gordon Renz happy. Because as you already know, if you don't give him the lamb sauce, no good. And trying it with the lamb sauce? Okay, yes Gordon Renzi, the lamb sauce does make it better. But I'm telling you right now, if you don't want to make the sauce, it's good enough. But if you have the time, make it because you will not regret it. Now jumping on to the next one, we're going to make an amazing and incredible chicken breast. And this one is going to be real good. And of course, we start off with four of them. These are organic chicken breasts. And if you have a choice to buy organic, definitely do. It just tastes better. To season them, I threw in salt, followed by freshly ground black pepper, garlic powder, and onion powder. Just like every single meat, make sure you season all sides, including the edges. To ensure that we cook them evenly, I like to use a meat mallet. And to make sure we don't splatter anything all over the place, it is always best to start with some clinch plastic. Using the meat mallet, hammer them down as much as possible. You want them nice and flat to make sure every single one of them has the same thickness. And I definitely recommend starting the seasoning before this process. This allows you to press the seasoning down into the meat. Now to help achieve that golden brown crust that we are always looking for on chicken breast, I like to use a little bit of all-purpose flour. Keep in mind that we're not making fried chicken here. We just want a nice dry surface. But at the same time, adding a nice crust on the chicken. So talking about that, now that I have it ready, it's time to cook. I set my cast iron skillet to medium-high heat. Threw in my oil and started to sear. One important thing to remember is to have enough oil onto the pan. Because of the flour, I recommend not touching this one for at least one minute. Because once that minute is up, I do my first turn and check that out. Nice golden brown crust, exactly what we're looking for. I like to cook my chicken breast until I reach an internal temperature of 160. Because as it rests, it will climb up to 165. Which is exactly what the FDA recommends. And as you can see, I was left with perfectly cooked chicken. Now using the same cast iron skin, I threw in white mushrooms. Kept them moving until I deglazed the entire pan. To help extract even more moisture, I threw in a little bit of salt. Mix it well and cook those mushrooms until they were fully cooked. And you can tell when they look just like this. Then I threw in a little bit of onions, followed by garlic paste, and mixed it well. Once everything has been combined, throw in a little bit of chicken stock, followed by heavy cream. Mix everything well and combine both of those ingredients together. To finish it off, all there's left to do is to emulsify a little bit of cold butter, add in your chicken, throw in some parsley for coloring and flavor, and the absolute best way to have chicken breast is done. This, my friends, is as good as it gets. Making chicken breast like this is not only easy, but it's also something you can look forward to. And I'll tell you one thing, once you make it once, I'm pretty sure you're going to make it several times 
times over. Because if there's one thing cast iron is always good for is to cook beautiful chicken just like this. And let me not even begin to tell you how good that sauce is. Combining these both things together is absolutely phenomenal. And I definitely recommend you giving this one a go. Now let's talk about the butcher's secret steak. Because it's also known as hanger steak. And if you enjoy big flavors, this one is the steak for you. And as you can see, the marbling of this one is absolutely out of this world. That is exactly what you're looking for whenever you're purchasing any kind of steaks. To cook this one, it's pretty straightforward. We're gonna keep it as basic as possible. So I season it with salt, freshly ground black pepper, and garlic powder. As you already know, it is important to season both sides, including the edges. Now this might be one of the best methods to cook steak on a cast iron skillet. And that is to do the butter basting method. And for this one, I'm going to be using thyme, butter, and garlic. So I started up my gas stove and set it to high heat. Threw in a little bit of grapeseed oil and started the sear. This steak is nice and thin, so you really want high heat. And another thing I recommend is to keep it moving. That way we ensure that you cook the steak evenly. Just like previously, you want to keep flipping that steak as much as possible. The last thing you want to do is to overcook a hanger steak. Because it will not be good. Once you've reached the sear that you're happy with, it's time to lower the heat. Throw in the garlic, butter and thyme. And here is a great tip. If you did not throw enough butter on the pan to baste it with a spoon, the easiest and the best way to do it is just to move the steak around. That way we ensure that every single edge of that steak is perfectly basted. Because all you're really trying to do is to infuse that butter flavor onto the steak. And at the same time keeping the eye on the temperature. Because you are shooting for an internal temperature of 135 degrees Fahrenheit. And once that's reached, your hanger steak is ready. The cast iron skillet definitely did its job. And as I took my slice, oof. That is juicy. Eating it just like this, nice, juicy, and tender is definitely the way to go. Because this is a very flavorful steak. And overcooking something like this would totally be a crime. And if you've never tried a hanger steak, definitely give it a go. It might become one of your favorite steaks to eat. Moving on to the next one, I know what you're thinking. Guga, you're cooking chicken again? No, 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 my friends, this is not chicken. I know it looks like one, but I can guarantee you it's not. Because we're talking about this one. One right here and I'm gonna ask you to go down on the comment section and let me know what this is because if you do I'll tell you right now you are good you gotta have an open mind for this one because this is one of those meats that we say don't knock it until you try it and if you've never had it it's real good and it's super easy to make and as I open the whole thing up hopefully by now you know exactly what it is we're talking about a rabbit now you can cook it whole and I've done that before and if you have not seen that video make sure you check it out on the card above before the cast iron skillet we're gonna take it apart and it's pretty easy to do I started by removing the thighs and there should be no force just go nice and slow and make sure you cut between the bones once both legs were removed I jumped into the arms and that is the same exact process just let your knife do the work and go nice and slow once both were taken out flip it on its back and start working on the tenderloins it is pretty easy to do you just just gotta run your knife through the backbone. It is similar to filleting a fish. Nice and slow and precise cuts with the knife will make the job easy. Because as you already know, a rabbit it's not that large. But once I was done with all of the butchering, this is what I was left with. We got the thighs, the arms, and everyone's favorite, the tenderloin. But now that our butchering is completely done, all there's left to do is to apply our marinade. And this marinade is fantastic. And here's how to make it. Into the food processor I threw in some garlic and chopped it all up. And here's one of my favorite things to use that I get asked all the time. These are red onions. However, they are freeze-dried onions. And I'll tell you one thing, if you've never had freeze-dried onions, man, you should. Because they are absolutely phenomenal. The same goes for parsley. And this one is also freeze-dry. So after throwing both of them in, I added a little bit of chili flakes. And when I say a little, I mean a lot. Because we want our rabbit to have a nice flavor. Then to finish it off the marinade I added olive oil, turn on the food processor and let it run. To finish it all up add a little bit of lemon juice followed by salt, turn on your food processor, mix everything well and your marinade is done. Even if you don't use this marinade for a rabbit at least use it for chicken because this one is a winner. And just like the lamb chop if you want the marinade to penetrate deeply into the meat I definitely recommend vacuum sealing it. This cuts the marination time to half. 
and always remember to let it marinate in your refrigerator. Talking about that, I let it marinate for a total of 12 hours. The very next day, I took it out of the bag, and as you can see, it is ready to be cooked. Cooking a rabbit in a cast iron skillet is very similar to chicken. Keep it under medium-high heat and flip it every minute or so. You're looking for that nice, beautiful caramelization on top. I recommend to keep flipping it until you reach an internal temperature of 160 degrees Fahrenheit. That will give you a perfectly cooked rabbit. And as you can see, by the time mine was done, it just looked perfect. And if you've never had rabbit, you should. I mean, check this out as I take my first slice. It is very similar to chicken, but it's not chicken. And I'll tell you one thing, if you never had it, definitely give it a try. Because some of my family members like rabbits way more than chicken. I just don't tell them what it is. Because as far as they know, they just think it's chicken. So we'll keep that just between you and me. That is all the meat I currently have in my house. I cooked everything, everybody. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you do enjoy it, make sure to give it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, be sure to subscribe for future videos. Remember, if you are interested in anything I use, everything is always in the description down below. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Stay safe, keep cooking. If you keep cooking, I will. See you guys on the next one. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.